Hi, everyone. My name is Alistair Wheat. I'm the head of uh, products and partnerships here at Analytica. And I'm delighted to be joined today by Jason Falls, who many of you will know about through his online writing. Um, but I'm going to give uh, Jason, first of all, a chance to tell us a bit about himself. And then I've got a bunch of questions lined up. To awesome. ask you more. Well, uh, thanks. You yeah, thanks for thanks for having me, Alistair. It's great to be here. Um, I uh, if I guess the, the easy way to explain me is um, I'm, a, I'm a digital strategist uh, at a full service advertising agency in Lexington, Kentucky in the United States. Um, and I work with a variety of clients. Um, I uh, use platforms like Analytica to help identify influencers for our clients. But uh, because I've written a couple of books, I speak at some conferences um, and, uh, you know, share my uh, you know, thoughts and ideas and, and experiences about uh, marketing in the marketing and social technology space over the years, I've become a bit of an influencer myself. So I have brands who come to me because I have a personal blog, I have a podcast, I have, uh, you know, a modest following on social networks of people in the uh, marketing, public relations, advertising space. Um, I get a lot of uh, SaaS you know, software providers who reach out to me and say, we'd like to use you to, you know, sort of help tell people about our product. So I, I have that unique perspective of, of designing influencer marketing programs, uh, leveraging influencer marketing software, and then also being on the other side as an influencer from time to time. So I kind of see the industry from a couple of different perspectives. One of the particular reasons why we're talking to you now is because you've got a book coming out and we're particularly excited about that because it's going to hopefully help our clients, uh, do what we want to help them do better. So why don't you tell us a bit about that? I'm sure uh, you know, I'm not, not going to have to ask for too much encouragement to get sure. started with the book, but uh, spill the beans. <laughs> well, we're we're in the early stages still. Book book pro projects take you know anywhere from nine to twelve months, and I actually literally just signed the contract last night, even though we announced huh. it a few weeks ago. So Entrepreneur okay. Press is my publisher. They're they're going to be publishing the book as soon as I get it done. Um, hopefully it will come out in late 2020, early 2021. Uh, the working title right now is called Winfluence. Uh, in, and I think the subtitle is something along the lines of the, uh, the definitive guide to developing powerful influencer marketing programs. Um, however, I'm going to, um, I'm already going to negotiate with them a little bit because, uh, the, the overall gist of the book, uh, I think is going to be, uh, trying, trying to explain to businesses and brands and, and people who are influencers as well, that I think we as an industry need to get away from this term influencer marketing and think of it more broadly as influence marketing because it's more than just YouTube and Instagram and, and Facebook and and Twitch. It's 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 beyond that. You know, anytime we need to persuade an audience uh, to think a different way, to act a different way, to have a different opinion, to try a product or service, we're trying to persuade or influence them. And that could be through advertising, but it could also be through, you know, sort of this association with someone who is a trusted resource for that audience online. So um, I think of influence a little bit more broadly, and I'm hoping that the book, at least so far, the book is evolving that way. Um, it'll be, it'll have all the practical, tactical, here's how you develop influencer marketing programs. But I'm hopefully going to bring a perspective to the table that says, hey, this isn't some social media niche thing. This is a much more broad practice that we all need to adopt. And that is going to be great, I think, for the industry, because there's uh, still, I think, a lack of understanding about how to do a lot of that. So uh, we'll be very glad to help uh, promote that book good it comes out and spread the word and uh, yeah we've obviously no known about it being in the works for a while so uh it would be great to, to see how that develops over the coming months um talking about influence marketing who has influenced you i'm sure there's been people that have uh, inspired you over the years but uh, maybe give us your top top three half a dozen people that uh, influence you well i mean i think um you know obviously i try to gobble up uh, information in the social technology, uh, productivity, uh, computer software technology space. And so I'm probably going to bleed a little over toward the tech side of the marketing world. Um, and so I remember, um, you know, obviously Robert Scoble has been a big influencer for me because he was Microsoft's original blogger. He talks a lot about 
uh, uh, you know, tech startups and, and different technologies that come to the table. Um, he hasn't done quite as much of that in the last couple of years, but back in the mid to 2000s, he was enormously impactful because he would basically expose new software packages to people like me. And when they had a marketing bend, it interested me because it would help my clients. And so I think he was pretty impactful. There was another, um, uh, and I've got an interesting influencer story about this one. The, the second person I would bring to the table is because of Robert, and that's a, a gentleman by the name of Lewis Gray. Um, and the reason that he's relevant is because he did the, much of the same thing. He would talk about social technology and software and that influenced me and, and gave me ideas on what I could be, you know, telling my audience and telling my clients. But I also actually used Lewis as an interesting path to get to Robert Scoble for a client who had a software package and they wanted Robert Scoble to talk about their software package. Well, I wasn't really directly connected with Robert. I'd met him a couple of times, but we didn't really know each other very well. And so I basically realized after watching his feed for a, a couple of months, he responds to and comments on Lewis Gray's content. So he and Lewis are obviously connected and friends. So I started reaching out to Lewis on behalf of this software client and talking to Lewis about that. And then when Lewis started to talk about them, Robert suddenly saw them and started to think, hey, maybe I should look into them a little bit better. So I used an influencer to influence an influencer uh, on behalf of one of my clients once. And so um, those two are, are really impactful to me uh, for a, a lot of reasons. And I think the other one, you know, back in the early days of social media, I was not in the first wave of social media thinkers to come through. I was probably in the second wave of social media people who became known for that and wrote books about it and stuff like that. But one of the people who was in one of the first waves was Chris Brogan, and he still has a, a massive audience and uh, impacts a lot of people in the you know social media marketing uh, you know, business entrepreneurship space. Um, Chris and I have become friends over the years because not only was he an influencer that that I followed and learned from, but I eventually reached out to him and we became friends and you know shared notes and whatnot. And um, we're 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 still friends. We still communicate on a pretty regular basis. And I just love what Chris brings to the table. He brings kind of humanity back to business, uh, which is kind of his angle. And I really really enjoy that. It's got a real social media ethos about what he does, which is really cool. Great. Um, now you've touched upon it a bit already because uh, you both work with clients to help them connect with influencers. That uh, little analogy you gave of uh, connecting with Robert Scoble is, is a great example of how to work with an influencer to reach another, maybe bigger influencer. Mm -hmm. But um, as you've also talked about, you are yourself an influencer on marketing and, and other topics. Um, so if a brand, uh, thinking about a brand working with you as an influencer, what are the sorts of things that you are interested in when a brand reaches out? What are the sorts of things a brand would want to say or how should they connect with you? Sure. Um, I am always... Um, are you and Lewis Grace? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm always <laughs> impressed when brands reach out to me and they, they've they done their homework and they know, okay, Jason's got a podcast. No, it doesn't have a bazillion downloads or, or listeners, but it's important to Jason and he's trying to build that. So, Hey, is there a way we can partner with you to help promote your podcast or can we you know, sponsor an episode or two when they come to me and say, Hey, we know we're trying, you're trying to grow this new podcast. We'd like to be a part of that. That impresses me because it, it shows me they're paying attention to what I'm doing and what I'm currently really interested in. Um, but if they're just like, Hey, we, we really want to tap into your audience because we know that, you know, people at advertising agencies, PR firms listen to you and we sell to that group. And so we'd like to partner. I've always been really interested in the ones who um, want to, you know, want me to go beyond reviewing their product. Where they want to uh, bring me in to do a webinar or they want to invite me to their conference to speak or they want to leverage my experience and my connectivity with that audience um, to, you know, transmit some trust to that audience on their behalf. And so if I look at a software or look at a company that's trying to market a product to them and I agree, hey, this is a really good product and I can see how it can fit into the daily use or the life or the, the work life of the people that listen to me, I'm happy to say, hey, I trust this product. I use it. I've used it. I don't do anything. I don't endorse anything or, or partner with anyone that I don't actually agree that their product is a good product. Um, but I really like the ones who understand 
uh, what I bring to the table in terms of, of whether it's, you know, engaging an audience with a podcast or a webinar or coming and speaking at an event. Um, if they say, hey, we just want to sponsor a blog post on your blog, I'm, I'm kind of less interested in that, although that's normally a value add or part of what I bring to the table. But it's really sort of bringing me in to uh, not only tell my audience about their product or service, but grow my presence within their audience as well. So uh, I love those sort of you know mutually beneficial relationships. Great. So you talked a bit about um, the sort of things that, that you can do with a brand. Um, if a brand is approaching you um, to, to partner with you, what are the sorts of things that you look out for when the, the brand? So you know, hopefully they've done their homework, they know a bit about you, they're saying the right things, the approach has been done in the right way, but then you maybe go and look at them and you're looking at their brand and what they do. What are the sorts of things about a brand that interest you to work with them? Um, sure. Or specific about the way that they want to work with you that, that really appeal to you? Yeah, I, I think obviously, you know, their their product or service has to be, you know, reliable. It has to be trustworthy. I have to be able to use it and and know that it it does what they claim it does. Uh, if if it's they have this, you know, self aggrandizing way to approach the market, we're the greatest thing since sliced bread. We're going to revolutionize the industry, and it's just another you know management platform that does the same thing all the other platforms do. I'm normally pretty frank with them. I say, look, you're overselling your product. It doesn't do all that. It's just it's just this, and there's nothing wrong with it just being that. But we need to be honest about it. So that that sort of honesty and, and humanity and integrity about what they're doing and how they're talking about it is important to me. Um, also, I love to, you know, I, I would be hesitant to work with a, a, a company that didn't have some sort of uh, social presence where they're engaging people who ask questions, who, um, you know, want uh, to you know, have customer service or whatnot. If I don't see them responding to people on Twitter or if they're not responding to people on their Facebook feed or on LinkedIn or whatnot, then that tells me that they're they're closing their walls off and they're pushing everything outward. They're not really interested in those back and forth engagements. And so that tells me that that they're not really, uh, you know, focused on the customer. They're focused on themselves. Mm -hmm. And those aren't the kind of companies that I, I think are very successful. And those aren't the kind of companies that my audience wants to deal with. So I typically don't want to deal with them either. Yeah. So you're, you're quite selective and careful about who you work with. Yeah. I mean, if somebody walks in and says, you know, we'll give you a couple hundred thousand dollars to do something, I might think long and hard about it, even if I didn't like them. But, <laughs> uh, but in, in at the end, if you, if you violate the trust that your audience has in you, and this is not just for influencers, but for brands too, if you do something to or with or in front of your audience that, you know, sort of undermines the integrity and the trust that they think that you have and they've built up for you uh, in the relationship they've had with you, then you lose in the end. You know, my audience is going to go away if I start selling out. And so I have to be really selective on, who I work with and who I bring to them and say, Hey, I'm partnering with this company or this event. And I really want you to get involved. I'm speaking at an event in, in Chicago in April and I wouldn't, you know, just promote it because I'm speaking there. I'm promoting it as if I want to go and listen to all the other speakers because the, the speaking event is not about me. I'm like, Hey, you can come see me speak, but more importantly, Jim Tobin is hosting this thing and all these other, you know, really, um, you know, cool people in the space are going to be there. And so you can come and learn from them. So I'm going to get behind it if there's really good value in the audience and, and it, it's not necessarily focused on benefiting just me. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't want to steal any thunder from your book, but uh, <laughs> this is a maybe broader question here. If there was one thing you could change about the influence marketing industry, what would it be? Wow. Um, Huh, that's a good question. Um, I think the I really would love for there to be a more distinct separation between people with influence um, and celebrities, hmm. right? Because every time the influencer marketing conversation comes up, one of the you know first words that comes out of people's mouths is Kardashian. The Kardashians are not influencers. The Kardashians are celebrities. They're reality show TV people. They live in a fake world, in a fake life, in a fake town, in a fake place, right? That's that they, they've created a reality, reality for the world to watch. They live in a fishbowl. They're celebrities. Um, they don't have to sell a product. They don't have to endorse a product to make a bazillion dollars because of just who they are, what they do, and, and where they are. 
Um, and so I don't consider celebrities influencers. I consider them celebrity endorsers. So if Kendall Jenner, you know, endorses a product or rolls out her own product line and whatnot, then, you know, from an entrepreneur perspective, I can see it gets a little different, but at the mm -hmm. same time they endorse products and there's, there's, mm -hmm. You know, some value that goes along with that. But I consider people who have influence, um, you know, people very different from celebrities. Um, it's people who have earned that influence because they're smart about something or uh, they, you know, have a certain uh, perspective on the, the, the world of fashion or style or beauty or whatnot that they're not getting from other media outlets or even other celebrities. People who have kind of earned the right to talk to an audience and that audience trusts them. That's who I consider influential, who, who I would put that influencer term on, even though I'm trying to get, you know, broaden it out and talk about people with influence rather than influencers. Cause I think that's been mislabeled a little bit by a lot of people, but I really wish if I could change anything, I would say here's celebrities and then here are people with influence or quote unquote influencers, yeah. because I think that would give, um, you know, brands a little bit more clarity on everything from how much impact one can have, uh, how valuable the relationship is going to be to how much budget they need to have to come to the table with. Yeah. I think that word influencer is becoming increasingly a loaded word and people often think of very different things when they hear that word. So it's a, kind of a challenge for us when we're talking with clients about influence marketing. Um, now, what you were talking about now, I think is also part of the general problem that most influence marketing really has been in the consumer space. Um, but it, it's also very important um, as part of the B2B marketing mix. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and you've got an experience on both sides of, of the fence, B2B and B2C. Um, but I'd be interested to know what are your predictions or where do you see B2B influencer marketing space going to in the coming year? You know, I, I really think the B2B space is where influencer marketing sort of as a practice can fle really flexes its muscles because B2B companies are not going to invest in someone who is superficial, in someone who just gets attention but doesn't actually drive action because B2B companies are all about lead generation. They're all about conversions. They're all about measuring, um, you know, the impact of what they're doing because that's that's how they they have to in order to be able to justify marketing spend. When you're a, a B2B company, you don't take out a Super Bowl ad. You don't take out a, an ad in a magazine or, or a television commercial. You have to zero in on a very specific audience. And so, influential people within that audience are a, a, a very effective and a natural path for B2B companies to go to because they're not trying to get in front of 100,000 people. They're trying to get in front of a thousand of the right people. And those influential people within that space are going to have, you know, sort of the, those eyeballs. Um, I would even take it even more granularly because I think Robert Scoble, an example we used earlier in the conversation, he is a really good B2B influencer, especially in the technology software uh, app productivity space. But Robert Scoble uh, appeals uh, to a much more broad, almost mainstream consumer audience. So like, for instance, when Uber first came out, they would want to go to Scoble because he talks to a lot of people who are sort of tech savvy and they want them to start using this app. Right. Robert's not going to be the best uh, person for a software as a service that uh, that services the healthcare or financial services industries, though, even though he's big in tech, even though him talking about them would be beneficial. He's not going to be number one on their list because he doesn't talk exclusively to CFOs at healthcare companies. And that's ultimately who you need to get in front of. That's why software like Analytica is, is so great for B2B companies because you can actually use the intelligence that's out there about those people who talk about certain topics and really understand, okay, this person might impact the healthcare industry, but they're talking to nurses. This person over here impacts the healthcare industry and they're talking to people who make purchase decisions. And that's a big difference in, in who you want to reach out to. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks for that shout out. Um, <laughs> final, final question, uh, very important question for me. Um, but uh, how do you uh, maintain such an impressive beard? I really oh, this is, yeah, this is, is getting there. 
it's getting there. I've got a little sort of Pepe Le Pew thing still going on here <laughs> on either side. But uh, I, to be honest with you, I had a goatee for the longest time. And then my kids just kind of jokingly one day said, you should grow a beard. And so I did. And then I kept it kind of trimmed close for a while. But then someone said, you should. And this was after like the Duck Dynasty, you know, long beard thing. They said, you should let it grow out and see how big you can get it. And I just kind of let it go. So um, I do use uh, a, a special beard shampoo uh, okay. and, and to keep it soft because my, my daughter likes to sit next to me on the couch sometimes and and kind of, you know, gorilla comb my beard for me. Uh, so I try to keep it soft. And then I actually put about twice a week, I use beard oil, which actually moisturizes the, the follicles and makes it even softer. So beard oil and, and beard face wash for the shower. That's how I do it. Important Good. stuff we're talking about over here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah the, this is where to come if you want influence marketing tips and how to get a nice long beard. I was going to say, if there's any beard oil, beard face wash companies out there who need an influencer, we yeah, can yeah. have a conversation because I've got I've got a good thing going on here. Please <laughs> <laughs> make sure we add that to our database. Sir. <laughs> exactly. Let's do some searches. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jason. Uh, loads of really good tips there. And uh, yeah, we'll uh, we'll be talking with you through the, through the year as well. And uh, it's a great having this chat with you. And uh, I really hope this is helpful for any of our clients who, uh, who are in the space. And uh, we'll certainly be giving your book a shout out when it comes around. Well, I, I, I very, very much appreciate that. I hope the book is useful for everyone. And, and uh, when it comes out, we'll come back and talk about it more. Thank you. Great. Have a good day. All right. You too.